Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to speak speaking in Portuguese, uh, but these slides were prepared in Brazil, uh, so that's why you see the title uh, in uh, Portuguese. Uh, what I'd like to do is begin with kind of an introduction to game theory, and then talk about the, the subject of the book, some unusual applications uh, of game theory. And... Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, <clears throat> give a number of examples in the beginning, and then we're going to take a vote, since I'm interested in voting theory, of what you'd like me to speak about a little more. But let me begin by saying that um, game theory was invented in practically one fell stroke with the publication of uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern's book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, in 1944, at the height of the war, World War II, and it was thought it might be a major contribution to the war effort. Um, I never knew von Neumann. He died in the 50s, but I got to know Oscar Morgenstern quite well because after he retired from Princeton, we were colleagues at NYU from 1972 to 1978 when he died. Uh, so I was regaled by many stories about von Neumann, whom some consider the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, maybe rivaled by Hilbert or Poincaré, uh, but he worked in a number of different fields. But game theory was a major field for von Neumann. Uh, when the book was published, um, it uh, did not exactly take the world by storm. It uh, was very dense mathematically, and uh, even mathematicians had difficulty with it. Uh, but by the 1950s, it became uh, quite prominent because strategists, uh, particularly concerned with um, the Soviet Union, uh, began to use game theory to study questions of nuclear deterrence, arms races, and so on. Much work at the RAND Corporation on this. Uh, and then in the 1960s, 1970s, economists became more and more interested, and that's the field in which game theory is most applied, uh, for example, to the study of auctions. Um, and many game theorists advised uh, the U.S. government and other governments about the auctions that we've had of the spectrum, uh, the electronic spectrum, and um, governments have made tens of billions of dollars from these auctions. Um, it became much more uh, used in political science, my field, uh, beginning the 70s and the 1980s, and now... Uh, it's become prominent in not only political science and economics, but several other fields, including the sciences. Uh, evolutionary biology is largely based upon game theory models now. Some of you might be familiar with Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, so it cuts across many different fields. It uses quite different kinds of mathematics. Um, what it hasn't been so much used for is applications to the humanities. Uh, literature, history, philosophy, theology, uh, law even. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the figures in the book, illustrating two-person games for the most part, uh, and uh, we'll see what you like. We'll vote on these, and um, then I'll go back, if there's time, and talk about them in more detail and the conclusions I reached in doing the analysis. So uh, let's begin. Uh, and I'm going to come out here because I'm going to uh, maybe say a little bit about these matrices. So I'm going to concentrate on two-by-two two games, uh, two players, each with two strategies. So this is a game between Samson and Delilah. Uh, Delilah can nag Samson for the secret of his strength, and not nag him. And uh, Samson can tell the secret of his strength, which of course was his long hair, or not tell. So what I indicate is, uh, for each pair of strategies of the players, uh, the outcomes. So in the upper left, for example, if Delilah doesn't nag Samson, and he doesn't tell his secret, Delilah's going to be pretty unhappy. But because Samson's unforthcoming, but uh, that's great for Samson because this is a woman he loves, she's not being nagged, and he's not giving up the secret. So I indicate the payoffs in terms of ranks, four best, three next best, two next worst, and one worst. 
So I assume no cardinal values, no um, <coughs> uh, specific numbers uh, associated with these payoffs. It's just a ranking. The higher the number, uh, the better the payoff. And uh, what I argue in this game is uh, why p a particular outcome occurred. And uh, I'm going to look at this in terms of what we call Nash equilibria, stable outcomes, but also in terms of something I call theory of moves, in which uh, the stable outcomes are based upon thinking ahead, and I call those non-myopic equilibria. And I'm sometimes going to expand the game because Delilah acts first. She shows whether to nag or not nag Samson for the secret of his strength. Uh, Samson then responds, and his strategies in the 2 by 4 game are contingent upon what Delilah does first. I also should say that the payoffs, just the ranks, are expressed such that the first number in the ordered pair is the payoff to the row player, Delilah. The second number, the payoff to the column player, uh, Samson, in this particular case. So that's one game. I also look at several other games in the Bible, not so much in this book, but in an earlier book called Biblical Games. But I think perhaps the most important story that I analyzed, but it was a little complicated, so I didn't put it up here, is uh, Abraham's attempted sacrifice of his son Isaac, the Akeda. Uh, and that was not consummated because an, an angel intervenes at the last moment to prevent um, the sacrifice. Uh, but the question is, was Abraham just the blindly faithful servant of God following his command, or was he calculating? Did he actually figure that God would renege at the last moment to prevent the sacrifice? So I could talk a little bit about that, even though I'm not showing the payoff matrix. Okay, next is a question in philosophy of religion and theology. Uh, the player on the, uh, the role player is uh, a superior being, whom I abbreviate SB, it's purely coincidental that those are my initials, of course. <laughs> and the ordinary person is just P, the rest of you. <laughs> and uh, SP can choose to reveal himself, herself, itself. But if he reveals himself, I'll just use an abbreviation like that, it establishes, no, I'll go back to it. It, it establishes its existence. Um, and if he doesn't reveal it, he, she, if it doesn't reveal itself, it doesn't establish its existence. And if you read the Bible, you'll find that um, the overweening, well, I'm going to come back to that. So those are the strategies of SB, and the person can choose to believe in SB's existence and not believe. And uh, the payoffs are such that um, the person, uh, whom I assume is a kind of agnostic, would like to see evidence. So... Uh, he or she would prefer to believe if there's revelation. Uh, next best would prefer not to, to uh, not believe if there's no revelation. Then the off-diagonal uh, are lower outcomes, including a mutually worst outcome for both players. Um, <clears throat> next is uh, the uh, story based on the play, Aristophanes' play, Lysistrata in which the women go on a sex strike against the men to bring them home from fighting. Uh, and the women may refrain from having sex or not refrain. Uh, the women are led by Lysistrata. And the men can choose to continue their fighting or not continue. And you can see there are various consequences for that. Uh, so that's also an ancient game. Uh, then I look at a Shakespeare play, uh, Macbeth, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and I pick up the action at the beginning of the play. Uh, there is uh, the scene at the beginning in which uh, the three weird sisters, or witches, uh, intimate that uh, Macbeth is destined to become the king of Scotland. Uh, and the, most per the person most excited by this is Lady Macbeth, much more ambitious than Macbeth. So uh, Macbeth because Macbeth proves in the beginning reluctant to kill the king and become king himself, especially because the king visits his own castle, uh, Lady Macbeth has to decide whether to incite him to murder King Duncan or not incite him. And Macbeth has to uh, choose to be an accessory to the crime and uh, aid in the killing or not aid in the killing. 
Now I look at a political game. Uh, this is uh, the U.S. Civil War, not exactly a small issue here. And uh, the conflict is between the Union and the Confederacy. And basically, they face the question of uh, compromising and not compromising on uh, the uh, overwhelming issue of the time, uh, slavery. And uh, <clears throat> there are consequences, of course, uh, to uh, what happens. And you can see there's kind of a compromise outcome in the upper left if they both compromise. And there's civil war in the lower right if they don't compromise. And what one would like to explain is uh, why the Confederacy, knowing full well that it had far inferior resources to the North, uh, the Union, started the war. And uh, that's what I try to explain in this case. Okay, another Shakespeare play, Hamlet, uh, and here the interesting question, at least to me, is that Hamlet is normally portrayed as an indecisive, vacillating character. He can't make up his mind what to do. He suspects that um, his uncle, uh, Claudius, murdered his father and then hastily married his mother, Gertrude, but he's not sure. Uh, and Claudius is worried that... Uh, Hamlet might uh, find out the truth, especially if he murdered uh, his father, and go after him. And um, what happens in the play is that uh, to try to find out the truth, uh, that Hamlet uh, stages a play within a play uh, in which the murder is reenacted. And uh, Claudius is in the audience, and he walks out angrily, uh, embarrassed that uh, there seems to be knowledge afoot that he was a murderer. Uh, but now Hamlet has a good, so to speak, on Claudius, and uh, Claudius knows that Hamlet knows, and uh, therefore they both, uh, they both move ahead, and uh, there's tragedy in the end, both die in the end. But I'm most interested in showing that Hamlet was a completely strategic character. It wasn't his um, indecisiveness uh, that was caused by a character flaw. It was much more that he needed more and better information about whether Claudius was truly the murderer of his father. And this I try to show in the analysis. Okay, this is maybe a little hard to read, uh, but this concerns the Iran hostage crisis in 1979-1980, and uh, President Jimmy Carter uh, had to choose to uh, negotiate with the Ayatollah Khomeini or not negotiate, in fact, intervene militarily, which the United States did, but the mission was aborted. And uh, Khomeini has to choose to negotiate or obstruct negotiations. And why I have two games here is that I argue that Carter misperceived Homini's preferences and played the wrong game, so to speak. Uh, so the payoffs are somewhat different in the upper matrix and the lower matrix. The real game was the lower matrix, reflecting Homini's true preferences. And what I show is that <coughs> that if uh, Carter had known Homini's true preferences, the outcome would be the circled outcome in the upper right where he succeeds because he obstructs negotiations, which led to the aborted mission. Uh, but Carter thought he was playing the game in the upper matrix, and there were two outcomes, which are non-myopic equilibria. And Carter thought he could induce the upper left, where there'd be compromise, so some deal would be worked out whereby the hostages would be released. But he was playing the wrong game, and uh, in a sense, how many won. Okay, uh, here I model the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, as a game of chicken. And in the game of chicken, uh, you might remember, um, if you've seen Rebel Without a Cause, a movie, read the book, um, the story is told that two teenagers uh, approach a cliff, and uh, each may either jump out at the last minute or not. Presumably, they both want to jump out. Uh, because if they don't jump out, there's a collision and both die. There's a, they both go off the cliff and they both die. Sometimes the story is told in which they approach each other on a 
one lane highway, and each can either swerve or not swerve. So it's a game of confrontation in which, in this case, the um, strategies are to blockade, which was euphemistically called a quarantine, or to escalate the airstrike. Uh, that's for the United States. For the Soviet Union, it could choose to withdraw its missiles or maintain the missiles. And I... <coughs> And in the, in this representation, nuclear war, which would be the result of an airstrike and maintaining the missiles, so it would escalate to this point, is considered the mutually worst outcome. But I don't think this was actually the game played. Uh, so I have an alternative representation, and that is this one. And here the outcome in the lower right, when the United States escalates to an airstrike, because it couldn't withdraw, induce withdrawal and uh, would be facing maintenance, would be an honorable U.S. action because the Soviets were maintaining the missiles. The United States had to move to the more escalatory choice. That's best for the United States, worse for the Soviet Union. Or <clears throat> if they were about to withdraw the missiles and we still escalated, this would be a bad outcome for both players, a dishonorable U.S. action. Still, the Soviets would presumably be thwarted, so it wouldn't be a good act, good uh, outcome for the uh, Soviet Union either. Okay, uh, this is uh, based upon the novel Catch-22, Joseph Heller's novel, published in 1961. And here, uh, the game is between a psychiatrist, Dr. Danica, who may judge a combat pilot, Yosarian, to be sane or insane, and Yosarian may be asked uh, for this judgment or not. And the problem is that if he asks, uh, Dr. Nika will know that he's sane and uh, he won't be relieved from combat duty. Uh, but if he doesn't ask, Dr. Nika doesn't want to do the paperwork uh, and therefore also won't relieve him from, cap uh, from uh, combat duty. And now we have uh, the... Uh, notion that any situation in which you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't is very frustrating and a catch-22. So uh, this is a situation which I model in the novel, but I was interested in the more serious application of catch-22 games. I have a class of games I call catch-22 games. And for that purpose, I looked at uh, medieval witch trials uh, in which... Um, Women, for the most part, were accused of being witches, and uh, they could confess or not confess, and the accusers could torture or not torture them. They would torture them if uh, they did not confess. If they confessed, they would be killed anyway. Oops. So those are some of the stories which I analyzed. So let's go back and take a vote and see what... <laughs> And we're going to use approval voting, uh, my favorite voting scheme, so you can vote for more than one. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to take rigorous count of votes, but I want to get some idea of what you might want me to expand upon. So uh, we started with the Samson and Delilah game. I also mentioned the um, game played between God and Abraham over the possible sacrifice of Isaac. How many were interested in these stories, the Bible stories? You can vote for more than one. Okay, I get some idea, maybe about a quarter. Okay, this is the uh, Revelation game where you have to make a choice about believing or not believing in a superior being. How many are interested in this? It looks like a little more. Uh, this is Strata, the women go on the sex strike. <laughs> oh, this is going to be tough. Not quite so many. Uh, Macbeth. Oh, more interest in Macbeth. Okay. Uh, the uh, Civil War. Oh, substantial interest. Uh, Hamlet. Some interest. Uh, Iran hostage crisis. Looks like that. Okay. And then the two versions of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, a lot of interest there. And uh, the Catch-22. 
Uh, not so much, I would say. And uh, medieval witch trials. Oh, you're too interested in too many things. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go back. Okay, um, let, let's skip Samson and Delilah for now. Okay? Uh, so, uh, that brings us to uh, the uh, <coughs> work on theology. And um, so, let me try to justify those payoffs. Uh, and I do so actually in terms of, if I find my folder here. Uh, primary and secondary goals, and I think that's worth going into a bit because anybody can say, uh, look, those numbers are pretty arbitrary. You could make up anything you wanted. Uh, so I prefer to talk about goals, and game theory makes no assumption about goals. If I desire to commit suicide and I succeed in doing so, I'm acting rationally because that was my goal. And um, excuse me a minute. I'm getting a little... It's another folder here that I need. Um, so what game theory is really concerned with is a uh, choice of the best means, whatever the goal is, and ask the question, do you choose the best means? And um, in the case of goals in this game, I wonder if we can turn up the lights, uh, because I was going to use a board for a minute to illustrate how we can uh, do how we can justify this game. I'll go over here. Thanks. So for the SB, the superior being, what I assume is a primary and a secondary goal. And my primary goal is that SB wants P person uh, to believe in its existence. And that's the overweening goal you find repeatedly in the Bible, uh, to believe in existence, especially of the chosen people, the Israelites. Let me try and let me try something else. Okay, so that's the primary goal. The secondary goal, um, based on the Bible, as I read it, is to... The first not to reveal itself. Why? Because if one reveals oneself, one's clear and present, and there can be no test of faith. And what uh, at least the God of the Bible wants is a true test of faith, uh, without evidence, belief without evidence, I put it that way. So those are the primary and secondary goals of the superior being. The P, uh, I said before, I'm assuming a P that's an agnostic. Um, so the primary goal is wants belief or non-belief confirmed by evidence, the scientific type, or the lack thereof. And the secondary goal of the person is, uh, prefers to believe. He's giving SP the benefit of the doubt. Prefers to believe in SP's existence. Okay. So now, what I do is use these goals to order the two best versus the two worst. So in the case of SP, he wants P to believe in its existence. So for SP, remember the first numbers are the rankings, payoffs to the role player, SP. So SP's two best outcomes, three and four, are associated with belief by P. And therefore his two worst outcomes are associated with non-belief. So the primary goal distinguishes the two best from the two worst. Then we appeal to the secondary goal to break the tie. So it prefers not to reveal itself. So <laughs> between these two, this would be the better. Four, three. And simply two, one. 
So this is a lexicographic preference ordering. So um, this completely defines the preferences <coughs> over the four outcomes for SB, as I've just done. Now let's go to P. Once belief or non-belief confirmed by evidence. So there's evidence up here for belief. There's no evidence for non-belief. Which is it better? We go to the secondary goal. Prefers to believe in SP's existence. So along the diagonal, this has to be the 4, and this has to be the 3, and then this has to be the 2, and this has to be the 1. So with these sets of goals, I have defined the matrix of best to worst outcomes for each of the players. Now what about the analysis? Well, <clears throat> standard game theory says uh, we look for whether a player has a dominant strategy, and uh, we find that SB does. Dominant strategy means whatever the other player does, uh, one strategy is preferred. So for SB, 4 is better than 3, and 2 is better than 1. So whatever P chooses, SB presumably would always choose this, because it always does better. If we compare the uh, payoffs to the column player, P, he or she doesn't have a dominant strategy because if SB chooses revelation, four is better than one, suggesting belief, but if it chooses non-revelation, three is better than two, suggesting non-belief. So P's best strategy depends on what SB does. Well, if this is a game of complete information, each knows the other's preferences, P should be able to figure out that uh, SB will always choose its dominant strategy, and now it's notes it's in the second row, so 3 is better than 2, so this should be the outcome. And this, in fact, is a unique Nash equilibrium in the game. It's a unique stable outcome in the following sense, that if either player deviates unilaterally by itself, it does worse. Uh, so if SB goes from non-revelation to revelation, it goes from the frying pan 2 into the fire 1. Or if P departs from don't believe to believe, it goes from 3 to 2. So neither player has an incentive to depart unilaterally from this lower right outcome. Now that's a little strange because here's an outcome better for both players. So we say it, uh, Pareto dominates this. It's better for both players. But it's not stable. Why? Because, yes, SB is doing pretty well up here, 3, but it does better going to non-revelation down here, 4. So this looks like a good outcome for both players, better for both than this, but it's not stable. Um, well, I have this argument. It's, a little detail to present here, but I claim that if players are not myopic, if they think more than one move ahead, and this is actually what I developed in a book called Theory of Moves, which is out here. In effect, they do backward induction, which is using the extensive form of the game for the game theorists here, within the payoff matrix. So players are thinking ahead. They're thinking, if I move, well, I might do worse, but that's going to induce the other player to make a counter move, and then I may make a counter counter move, and tracing this all out, considering the end point and working backwards, these turn out to be the non myopic equilibria, not this. So I have a different view of what is stable, this non uh, the non myopic equilibrium circle versus the Nash equilibrium, which is underscored. So I get two of these, and it depends on where you start. So I change the rules of standard game theory to say you don't choose strategies simultaneously and look for what's stable. You're starting in a particular state. There's a status quo. And then you ask whether moves and counter moves <coughs> would get you to something better. You're thinking ahead. And it depends on where you start, but notice that this equilibrium favors P, this equilibrium favors SB, and there's a kind of contest between these equilibria, and I'm indicating the cyclicity of the game with these arrows. 3 to 4 is better, 
SB, he can move from uh, top strategy to bottom strategy. 2 to 3 is better. 2 to 3 is better for P. Uh, now, 2 to 1 is not better. That's an impediment. That's what I stands for. But the role player, SB, would have an incentive to go to 1-1, one, one, not stay there, because the column player would have an incentive to go on, you see. So that's how, that's the kind of thinking that gets me to these as non-myopic equilibria. But more fundamentally, I think, this game is fundamentally unstable. Uh, and I think we observe this in life, uh, at least over the ages, that uh, <clears throat> people, we go through periods of religious revival and religious decline. And if this game is picking up this interaction between a superior being and a person, it's fundamentally unstable. And we go from a period of religious revival to a period of religious decline, like the Enlightenment, for example. And then we go back again. Some people argue we're going through a kind of orthodoxy now in different religions. So I think this is a partial explanation of this instability and the fact that we have these competing non-myopic equilibria uh, when people play this game with a superior being. Any questions? Yes. That's a good question. And my answer is that this game is played over the ages. So it's not physically the same player. It's our reading about these stories in the Bible. And the question of the existence of God in the Bible is never raised. There's obviously always a God for people at that time. But nowadays, we would say, OK, uh, and even in the Bible, um, when Moses was um, away for 40 days and 40 nights before he received the Ten Commandments, even the Israelites revolted and built the golden calf. So their memories are pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, one can go from uh, revelation to non-revelation, especially over generations and centuries. So I think you have to think of this game as played over the ages. People forget. We read the Bible, we hear about these miracles. God seems to exist, but is it real now? or we choose not to believe for that reason. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go on. Okay, uh, well, we've just done a, a fictional piece, so maybe I can give you the basics of this story. So Liz Strata organizes the women with great difficulty in the play uh, to refrain from sex. The game starts out here. Remember, we started a status quo outcome. It's success for the women success for the men. The women are frustrated. They're getting their next worst outcome. The men are getting their best outcome. They're doing what they want to do. At that time, it was fighting. And uh, the women are getting their next worst outcome. They're not refraining, so they're having sex. That's okay. But they carry out a threat. And uh, the threat would be, we're going to move to refrain, and those inflict upon the men the two worst outcomes, two and one. Well, the men don't quite believe it in the play, so the women actually have to carry out this threat. And now we're here, and this is thoroughly frustrating for both players. It's especially frustrating for the women because the men are still fighting, and they're not getting sex. And the men are unhappy because they're not getting sex also. So what does that do? That induces the men to hopefully get down here. But first, they have to come home for more. And they do in the play. This is success for the women. But <clears throat> the women are doing pretty well. The men are really not doing well at all here. They're not fighting and they're not having sex. <laughs> so there's a kind of pressure once here to go here, but then go on here. And that's exactly what happens in the play. Uh, in the end, the men capitulate. And uh, the women score well. They get sex and the men are home. And the women, the men don't do so badly. They're having sex, but they're not all fighting. And that's the denouement of the story. So uh, let's see what have we have next. Okay, I'll give you a kind of, I think I have time to kind of give you a brief recapitulation of these with a few details that I uh, didn't talk about before. So this happens at the beginning of the play. Um, and what I find particularly interesting uh, 
in the Lysistrata game, and also in this game, it's very strong women. And uh, Lady Macbeth is particularly strong. She makes a uh, famous speech uh, at this time, uh, talking about uh, her fortitude and claiming that Macbeth is weak. Uh, she even accuses him of unmanliness, uh, cowardliness, in not facing up to having to murder King Duncan in order to accede to the throne. So she says, uh, at this particular point, as she prepares herself to uh, push very hard on Macbeth, she says, Come, you spirits, attend on mortal thoughts, and sex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, and stop up access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell spirit. And a few lines later she says, Come thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes. Yes, I know I missed my profession. I should have been an actor. <laughs> but that's the best I can do. I did have the lead in my senior play, but it went downhill afterwards. So I became a political scientist. Okay. So she steals herself for the murder. And as I said, they start, uh, no, I didn't say, they start out here. She's not inciting. He's not about to kill or help kill King Duncan. Uh, this is a bad outcome for her, next worst. Still good for uh, Macbeth because he doesn't want to murder his own king. She escalates the conflict. This is extreme frustration for both players. Uh, Macbeth is being uh, <coughs> harassed terribly by his wife. And uh, Lady Macbeth is not getting her way. So now there's kind of an inducement to move on. And then Macbeth goes along and helps in the murder of King Duncan. So things are going pretty well then, but then they unravel pretty quickly in the play. Any questions? Okay, so I know some of you, many of you, were interested in this. Uh, so we can't condense the U.S. Civil War into a two-by-two -two matrix. I certainly admit that. <laughs> uh, but I think we can uh, get an idea of the kind of main strategic features of this war. So both have the same strategy of compromising or not compromising on the issue of slavery. And what happens, of course, is uh, that the South, the Confederacy, recognizing their weakness, thinks that if they score victories in the beginning, uh, they can convince the North that this will be a long and costly war if they pursue it. So they go for a negotiated settlement. They keep slaves in the South, the border states, that could be negotiated. And uh, they do win these early victories, beginning at Mount Sapna. Uh, but what they do is they underestimate the doggedness of Lincoln. Lincoln was willing to pursue to the utmost uh, the problem of slavery. And then we get into a prolonged war, the bloodiest war in American history, more casualties in the U.S. Civil War than World Wars I and II combined. And the population was a fraction of what it was in the 20th century. So um, <clears throat> what you see here in the payoffs is if they could compromise, they'd both do pretty well. Next best outcome. Uh, if the Confederacy, if the, if the Union doesn't compromise, uh, then <clears throat> and, the, and the Confederacy does, and the uh, Union wins four, and the Confederacy does badly, this is even worse for the Union, in Lincoln's estimation anyway, because if he compromises and the uh, South does not, he throws in the towel, this is his very worst outcome, and it's the best for the South. So I think what happened was the victories were not decisive, at least for Lincoln. He pursued the war. He ran through several generals, beginning with McClellan, who didn't fight. And then he found generals, finally, who could fight. Sherman and Grant in particular. So that's why we were stuck at this outcome for a long time. And then finally, the uh, South is prostrate, and it's uh, been thoroughly defeated, and things move over here, and there's a surrender at Appomattox. So I think what this is doing is showing why the Civil War broke out in the first place. There had been compromises beginning in 1821, in 1850. 
But slavery was still the dominant issue, and uh, Lincoln, in the end, pursued uh, the uh, <coughs> elimination of slavery, and he stuck with it. And that's, I think, the explanation here. Any questions? Well, I would say uh, there are always parallels. Uh, I haven't tried to... The question was, are there parallels to what happened recently in Washington? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think there were certainly parallels. I think uh, you'd have to be careful about actually putting in the payoffs. It might be a matrix very similar to this, if not the same matrix. Yes. And I think we did have a kind of civil war without arms. And uh, eventually, uh, the Tea Party submitted. But you have to be careful about these casual analogies, because I think there's more to it than this. I, so I'm a little reluctant to say this is the game. Yes? Oh, uh, yes. Um, what the second payoffs in brackets mean are the non-myopic equilibria. Now, there's only one in this game, one circled outcome. So wherever you start, you'll end up here. And that might be surprising because it's underscored, so it's also Nash equilibrium. It's myopic equilibrium as well as being non-myopic. So the two may coincide. But one would suspect that 3-3 is a pretty good outcome too, thinking non-myopically. It's a compromise outcome. But if you do the analysis, and that I don't have time for, you'll find that this is unique. So what I'm showing is from every outcome, you would end up at 4-2. If you go back where there were two non-myopic equilibria, I think we have to go back a couple. Well, actually, uh, three in this game. This is unusual. There are only two of the, there are <coughs> 78 distinct two by two, uh, strict or no games in which players rank outcomes from best to worst. There are only two, uh, in which there are three non-myopic equilibria. Most of either one or two. So this is a game with three. One, two, three. And you can see it depends on where you start. If you start at two, four, you'll end up at three, three. So you go through this outcome to this. But if you start here, you go through this outcome and back down again. And if you start here, you'll stay here. But if you start at any other outcome, you won't end up here. So this I call the anticipation game. Players have done the analysis. They're anticipating, if I start here, this is where I end, end up. And one could actually analyze the anticipation game and look for Nash equilibrium on that, too. Yes. Is there something to be said for games where the Nash equilibrium is not the same? It's not one of the... Yes, what, yes. What, what does that mean? Well, it means, uh, let's look at an example. I think... Uh, which one? I think the first one. The first one was one. No, the first, uh, let's see, I'm not even showing oh, the, this game. Uh, well, you see, you have two in this game. I'm not showing the anticipation game here because I hadn't introduced it in the book. By the way, um, I do have a book uh, on this if you want to learn more. Where did I put it? Uh, yeah. Oh, here it is, yeah. So let me pass this around because the details are in the book. Um, yeah, so I'm not showing the anticipation game in these early matrices. Uh, let's see. And not here. Okay, so we just did this game. But let's go on. You'll see a little bit more, okay? Any other questions before I go on? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's next, I guess. Yes. You want to go back? Yes. What would have, what meant, or if you need a compromise outcome? I, I don't know exactly what the compromise would be, but presumably uh, slavery would be preser preserved, but there might have been secession too. We might have let the South go. So I think the big question would be uh, what happens in the border states where there was the most conflict? And I don't know the answer. We don't know. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go on. Um, Okay, this is uh, pretty simple, so let me just say that um, the game starts out uh, here, uh, 
Hamlet hasn't revealed his uh, knowledge of uh, Claudius's complicity in the murder. And the non-myopic analysis says that you will go up here. Now, that's a terrible outcome for Claudius because he'd rather kill Hamlet first and be killed first. So he'll go over here. Hamlet will be killed, but he will also, Claudius will also die. So let's go on. This is a little complicated, but I already made the point that the misperception in this game made Carter think that he could get this compromise outcome, but the real game suggests this is the only non-myopic equilibria, and that's actually what happened. Yeah, there were several people. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's a good question about was Carter rational uh, in ordering the <laughs> uh, mission which had to be aborted. And uh, he presumably thought that there was hope of compromise and probably so advised. I think the rationality of Carter rests on should he have asked for others to advise him. Because if he was advised this way, uh, then it was problematic in retrospect. But maybe he should have sought more information. Okay, so uh, I, I told the story of chicken. This is a game of chicken. So if they collide, there's a mutually worst outcome. This game has three non-myopic equilibria. And now the slash means it depends on who moves first. Sometimes, Usually it doesn't depend on who moves first from a state, but here it does. But I think um, more interesting is what I think actually happened. And um, President Kennedy estimated the chances of war, not just not nuclear war, but any war with the Soviet Union between a third and one half. So there's no certainty that uh, if we'd gone to airstrike and they'd maintained the missiles, it would have been a major war, and maybe not even a nuclear war. Most, both sides did not have plentiful intercontinental ballistic missiles at the time. Um, so um, I think if the United States had used force because the Soviets were not withdrawing the missiles, uh, then it would be honorable because it would be justified. Here it would be dishonorable. In fact, Bobby Kennedy, who did advise his brother at the time, said um, if we went to airstrike and they were actually withdrawing their missiles, this would be a Pearl Harbor in reverse, and would blacken the name of uh, the U.S. in history. So that was a bad outcome for the United States, as well as, of course, thwarting the Soviets. But the Air Force, uh, the Air Force said that with 90 percent probability we could hit all the missiles, but that still left a 10 percent probability that uh, there would be missiles remaining. So that wasn't a surefire strategy either. Any questions? Yes. 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 Yeah, but this is exactly what you should be taking into account. Uh, and I think, I'm assuming for the most part, except in the misperception by Carter, that the players did have complete information about their opponent's ranking. Remember, I'm not asking for numerical values. I'm interested in best to worst rankings. And I think that's not uh, an unreasonable request when one has an opponent and one wants to get it right. But some of these games are pretty frustrating, even if you get it right. And Catch-22 is an example of that. Any other questions? Yes. And have you applied this to the United States and Iran now? Uh, no, I have Well, actually, in another paper, but not using this same theory. This uh, paper looks at games of incomplete information. You have probabilistic information. And the conclusion we came to is it might be two different games and we're not sure which one, and they have entirely different consequences. Uh, actually, the game we look at is the confrontation between Iran and Israel, not the United States. Yes, sir. Do you know if uh, President Carter or the kind of people who I thought, you know, were aware of this analysis? 
we actually use their books to uh, impute preferences to the players. So I've relied on them. I don't know whether they care about this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, so uh, I know my hour is about up. Uh, so this is actually uh, the last case. I think I talked about this, um, except to point out that uh, I'm also introducing notions of uh, power. One kind of notion is threat power, and threat power comes in two varieties. It may be deterrent or compellent. And this is a distinction made by Thomas Schelling in his uh, early work. Um, he wrote a couple books in the 1960s uh, called, well, it doesn't matter what the names are, but he teaches at the University of Maryland. He's a Nobel laureate. Uh, in economics, largely for his game theoretic work. And what I do is formalize these notions and uh, show how three different kinds of power, moving power, threat power, and auto power, can also affect the outcomes. It's not just a matter of uh, non-myopic equilibria. It's that there's a kind of inequality between the players, and uh, this power can make a difference. And I also look at, in the case of moving power, cycling. So if one player has moving power, he can always move down or up if he's a roller player. That's what I indicate by the double arrows. And Yossarian, I assume, uh, does not have this power. He's eventually going to have to throw in the towel, stopping when he's got the next move, here or here. And then I go through an analysis saying, what are the effects of having this endurance, this stamina, uh, versus a player not having this endurance, this stamina? So that's uh, a complication which I haven't talked about. Yes. Yes. Well, the, if he's judged and if he asks and he's judged insane, then he did the kind of right thing. But this is a terrible outcome for the doctor Danica. Oh. You see, because uh, he's relieved of combat duty, so that's his best outcome. But the doctor Nika has to do a lot of paperwork, and he dreads that. So that's his worst outcome. Yeah. And also, I distinguish between helping your buddies and not. So uh, up here, combat duty and insanity, he actually uh, shows no heroism if he's uh, insane. <laughs> uh, but here he's sane, and he does a dishonorable thing by trying to get out of combat duty. Um, and this isn't bad, because he does combat duty, uh, and he's supporting his buddies, uh, because he's judged sane. So I, I don't have time to go into the, the details, but the book has more. Yeah. It's the paperwork that uh, bosses Dr. Nika. So this is a more serious case, and much more serious than the witch trials in the United States. In the witch trials in the United States, in Salem, Massachusetts, and other places, relatively few people were killed. In medieval times in Europe, it's estimated that 100,000 people were killed, a really big number for the Middle Ages especially, and about two-thirds of these were women. Why were, uh, what started all this? Well, unlike the witch trials in, in the United States, uh, where there seems to have been genuine belief that these women were causing problems, that wasn't so much true in the Middle Ages. The accusers were trying to confiscate their property. That was their main goal. And uh, for the most part, they succeeded. Um, what's also interesting is that if the accusers torture, if the witches confess and the accusers torture, that's a uh, confession out of duress. And that was actually disallowed at the time. So this is a bad outcome for the accusers if they torture to get a confession. So what they would do is um, they would get a confession after the torture, but they couldn't execute the witch right away, the accused witch right away, so they had to go back and not torture her, and then try to get the confession, and they would try many times, and eventually they usually would get the confession. So that explains why this is a bad outcome for the accusers. Um, it's a better outcome if they torture uh, and she doesn't confess. Two is slightly better than... Uh, sorry, I'm getting confused here. Um, Okay, so, so this is a bad outcome for the accused. It's not so bad uh, for the accused witch. Um, 
what did I say, bread and law? Break, yeah, that should be break. Uh, by torturing after confession. And actually, this was a pretty good outcome for the uh, uh, accused witch. Well, not the worst outcome for the accused witch, because uh, she wouldn't confess. And one of the reasons she wouldn't confess is she didn't want to implicate her neighbors. So that's why I call it an honorable death. She's going to die, but at least she doesn't implicate her neighbors. Here, uh, they don't torture, she doesn't confess. That's great for her. But it's not great for the accusers, because they're not getting the property they want. And finally, here, if they don't torture, and she confesses anyway, because she might be tortured, uh, this is great for the accusers. They didn't have to work at it, and it's terrible for her because it's dishonorable. So I think I've gone through this pretty quickly and probably not given uh, you know, all the reasons that I should, but I think what it shows is that um, game theory is powerful in highlighting, in my opinion, the main strategic uh, lines of thinking of the players and why they make the choices that they do. And what I've introduced is um, this kind of non-myopic thinking, uh, which I think is actually characteristic of humans, but not animals. Game theory is much applied to look at competition of species uh, among non-human animals. And non-human animals, I don't think we have good evidence that they think ahead they're reacting to a particular stimulus. We are able to think ahead, at least we think we are. And uh, I think this is a kind of a concept that you want to build into your games and game play. Okay.